Greetings once again in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate our visitors that's visiting with us here at Northside on this beautiful Lord's Day. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. And I hope you in the radio listening audience will be praying for us and call a friend and have them to tune in. I want you to take your Bible today and turn to the book of Ruth, chapter 2, page 316 in the original Scofield Reference Bible. I'm bringing message number 16 today on the book of Ruth, and this will be the final message I'm bringing on the book of Ruth. I will have 16 tapes on the book of Ruth, and be available at three dollars each and the gift is used to help the prayer radio expense i'd be glad to send you a list of i cassette tape now the tape today would be number 268 i have about 266 tapes listed and if you want to write in and get a list of i cassette tape i'd be glad to send them to you i want you to remember that we work this together in getting out the gospel and this is not a fly-by-night ministry we're now in our 39th year of daily broadcasting from the classic city of Athens, georgia and when you have a part in this work, you're having a part in a home mission work that's blessed to the Lord, and I thank God that it is a blessing to a lot of, lot of people. We have shut-ins today that can't be in God's house and now listening. That's people in the hospital and convalescent homes that are listening. There are people in prison that are now listening. And many, many shut-ins and many lost people that don't, don't go to church at all, they're now listening to the sound of my voice. And what a wonderful way to get out the gospel. I covet your prayers. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. While you're turning to the book of Ruth, uh, chapter 2, I want to say this. Many years ago, one of my great presidents was called upon to reduce a death penalty that was headed down to a cold-blooded murder to life in prison. And he felt sorry for the man's family, so he reduced that to life in prison. It wasn't long until that man was out of prison. And he killed another man. And they went before the president again and said, Sir, would you watch again reduce this life, uh, this death penalty? He said, Absolutely not. He said, I'm responsible and completely responsible and guilty of that second man's death. I'm just as much responsible for his death as the man that killed him because I reduced that death penalty. And he said, Never would I do that again. Over here in Danielsville this past week, they tried a man committing cold blooded murder taking a hammer, going into a barbershop with a dead old gentleman in there. They've been serving the public for many years, good man, and in cold-blooded murder, robbed and killed that man. Here some 10 years, 11 years ago, maybe 10, they tried this man and sentenced him to die. And this crowd that hates the death penalty and crowd-loving crowd and the liberals and the infidels, they couldn't stand that. They say, we got to get this man, keep him out of the electric chair. So they finally figured out some way to try him again, which of course was stupid, but they did whoever, whoever let them try him again, of course did a stupid thing. The man was guilty at the first trial. They tried him again and sentenced him again to the electric chair. He was a guilty man. And so that same God-hating, Bible-hating, a crime-loving crowd that hates the cup for punishment and the death penalty, they said, we can't let this murder go to the electric chair. Let's get on a new trial. So they finally got a new trial at the expense of the taxpayers in Madison County who's having to pay all these bills and through these stupid silly technicalities they got another trial. Had no right to do so, but they did. The man should have been put to death in a short period of time after the first trial. And so they finally accomplished what they set out to do after a period of some 11 years. They got reduced to life in prison. And the man that wavered the death penalty and all those that put pressure on him to do so is going to be held accountable and face God in the judgment and have the blood of every crime that this man commits from now until he dies. Now the man won't be in prison long because he's already been incarcerated some 11 years and they'll finally have him out on the street again. But every crime he commits, that crowd that reduced that death penalty to life in prison is going to have the blood on their hands. See, they have no consideration for the poor, humble man that worked all of his life serving the public there in his barbershop. Good man. They had no sympathy for what he had to suffer. They had no sympathy for his family. They could care less. 
They don't care how much uh, innocent people suffer and law-abiding citizens suffer. They don't care. They don't give a rip. They were concerned about getting their point, keeping the man out of the electric chair. The man should have been put to death 10 years ago. We have a stupid judicial system in this land today. And there's no such thing as a life sentence. Whenever you say a man is sentenced to life, you might say he may be on three years, he may be on five, he may be on seven years. And while they call it a life sentence, I can't understand. That's stupid to do so. No such thing as a life sentence when you turn a man loose in a matter of a few years. A life sentence should be that he remain in prison the rest of his life. If you don't do that, if you can't do that, if it's not intended, then don't call it a life sentence. It's been a proven fact that every man that's ever been sentenced to a life sentence in the United States, they were out on the average of less than five years in prison. What a joke. What a joke. It's ludicrous. People all over this world are laughing about it. It's such a, a judicial system that we have here in America. Now, you say, preach Edwards, I don't like it. I don't care if you don't. I'm fed up with any such stuff as that. And the law-abiding citizens ought to speak up. Ought to speak up. These Bible haters and God haters and people that don't believe the Bible and move contrary to the word of God, they, they need to be exposed and they need to be let known that one of these days they're going to stand before the judge, the God of heaven. And the Bible is very clear huh, on the death penalty. God plainly says, when a man in cold-blooded murder kills another man, he is to be punished by being put to death. God's never changed. It's never been rescinded. Still in the word of God, Jesus didn't change that. These infidels and liberals and crime lovers and God-haters can talk to the time blue in the face. They can never change the word of God. Until we get back to some common sense and do what God said in this book, this land is going to be filled with criminals, more and more so as we move along. There used to be a day whenever they had the criminal behind the bars. Now he's on the street and the, and the poor law abiding citizens have to put bars on the windows of the house and lock and things like that and lock himself in to protect himself from the criminal. Been a great change, hasn't it? All right, you know who's guilty of that and giving the credit to the right source. The liberals, the infidels, the Bible haters, and the God haters, they're responsible for that. And that's not my message. I'm not going to charge anything for that. That's just my introduction. Now turn to the book of Ruth, chapter 2. This is message number 16. And Neil married a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn out of him, after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto him, Go, my daughter. Now I want to use for a subject today, if I may, Boaz, a type of Christ. I'll only be able to touch lightly upon these thoughts today, or briefly rather. But I want you to see this man Boaz here as a type of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord. Number one, see him as a type, as the Lord of the harvest. The Bible says in Ruth chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, And the whole Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord be with thee. Then Boaz said unto his servants that were over the reapers, Whose dancer is this? And here is a man that came on the field, and he is the Lord of the harvest, the Bible tells us. He owns the field. He's the Lord. Say now, uh, this fall or later on, then we're going to gather in the harvest. He said, the fields are right now, white on the harvest, and the labors are few. Jesus is the Lord of the harvest of souls in this world. And there's never been a time when the gospel is in a greater need of being gotten out and published as in this hour in which we live because of the many billions of people on the face of this earth. Beloved, the fields are white on the harvest and only a few people know God. And Jesus is the Lord of the harvest and he wants people to go into the harvest. He said, don't keep putting off saying, I'm going to get ready to get ready to get ready to get ready and then I'll go out and win souls. Then I'll go out and minister. He said, right now, start right now. Right now, start in the harvest. Already white and the labors are few. And you need to keep that in mind. In Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 20, he said, The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. There's multitudes that are not saved today, and the harvest is about over. Dwight L. Moody was preaching on this subject one time, and he kept repeating this verse, The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. There was an unsaved man in that audience, and it kept ringing in his ears. He would not come forward to get saved. And then he took seriously ill and he sent for Mr. Moody. And Mr. Moody went to his bedside 
And this man is repeating this verse. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. And over and over again he repeated that until he drew his last breath and went out in the eternity. If you're going to get in, you better get in now while getting in's good. There may come a time when it'll be too late. And so he's a type of Jesus Christ as the Lord of the harvest. Secondly, he's a type of Jesus in that he's the near kinsman. The Bible says in Ruth chapter 2 and verse 1, And Naomi had a kinsman, her husband, a mighty man of wealth, and the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. He was a near kinsman to this man, Elimelech, who had died, and his wife Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth. And the Bible said he was near kin to them. And of course, that uh, spelled out a lot. That meant that he was in a position to do something for them. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 11 and 17, the Bible said, For both he that sanctifieth, they are sanctified all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Talking about the Lord Jesus. Then verse 17, Wherefore all things it behoove him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now Jesus here, the Bible said he was not ashamed to call them brethren. He came down here took up on himself flesh and there lived among men that he might die on the cross and, and save lost sinners. He is our near kinsman in that respect. The Bible tells us so. We need to keep that in mind. Now Boaz here was the near kinsman and he'd have to take a near kinsman in order to pay the redemptive price. Now he brought a message I believe last Sunday on Boaz, uh, the buyer and the redeemer. And so here you have him as a type of Christ. In number three, he's a type of Jesus Christ and he's the supplier of the wants. The Bible says in Ruth chapter 2 verses 15 and 16, And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean among the sheaves and reproach her not and give her some handfuls on purpose. Here he supplied her very need. She was in need, and she needed some bread. She needed some grain. And when she came on Boaz's field, he took care of that. There he told the reapers, he said, when you're reaping the grain, then drop some handfuls on purpose. I want this woman to be supplied with food. Not only that, he had in mind Naomi. She could carry food back home to Naomi, and there they could have bread in the house. Now, Boaz knew that. Now, Jesus Christ is the one that takes care of our needs and our wants. The psalmist said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. There's many things we as God's people should not want for today because we can find them in Christ. What I mean by that, not go liking for them. We should want them and find them in the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, the Bible tells us. So he said, I want to see to it. That this beautiful Moabitess woman doesn't go liking. I'm going to take care of her wants. My God tonight is able. The Bible said God is able to supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. He tells us that. And God is able to take care of his own and take care of your wants. What is your want today? Now Jesus first of all of course will supply eternal life. If you want eternal life you can find that in the Lord. Salvation is in Christ. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So salvation is in Christ. You can have eternal life today. Secondly, he will give you the strength you need to live for God. I've heard people say, well, I'd get saved and uh, if I thought I could live it. I'm going to get saved when I think I can make it through. Now, if you wait until you think you can live to make it through, you'll die and go to hell. You need to realize when you get saved that God then comes in to live in the person of the Holy Spirit and he gives you the strength you need to carry on as you sojourn for him. That's like saying, well, I'm going to eat a bite of food when I find out how it tastes. Now, how are you going to find out how it tastes without tasting that food? you got to come to know Jesus Christ whether or not you know you can live it. And I have good news for you. He can live it through you. You can't live it on your own, but he can through you, and he will. He'll supply you the strength. 
And then he'll supply your every need. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. Whatever it is, God can take care of it. I've been serving God for many years. I was saved in 1940. Surrendered to preach two years later. And God's always taken care of me. And God will take care of me as long as I serve him and love and faithful to him as long as I'm on the earth. And he'll take care of you. He most certainly will if you will honor him. Jesus said honor him and God will honor you. And so you honor the Lord and the Lord will take care of your need whatever it may be. Number four, we see he's a redeemer of the inheritance. Now I enlarged upon that line of thought last uh, Sunday morning. But in Ruth chapter 4 verses 9 through and 10. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, your witnesses this day. I brought all that was Emma, bought all that was Elimelech, and all that was Kilions and Marlins of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth, the more by the wife of Marlin, have I purchased to be my wife to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. Now here we find that this man Boaz bought back everything that Elimelech had lost and Naomi had lost whenever they went down into Moab. They came back about nine or ten years later. And he bought back everything for them. That it might be restored back to them. He was the Redeemer. Now Jesus Christ today is our Redeemer. And Jesus Christ restores back to us everything we lost in Adam. Adam went down when he sinned in the Garden of Eden. God expelled him from the Garden. The human race went down in him. But beloved, we can come back and have restored everything that Adam lost. Because of our Redeemer, he paid the price and he redeemed us and, and we, he can restore and he does restore everything that we, we lose, we have lost in Adam. I want to read a verse or two in 1 Peter chapter 1. The Bible says here, beginning with verse 3 of 1 Peter chapter 1, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Notice where he had begotten us to. Watch this now. He said to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And then he said rejoice about that. So you see, according to the word of God, we find here that we can have restored back to us a great inheritance in Christ. Eternity alone is going to reveal the things that God has in store for those that love him on the other side. So be patient, move on and serve the Lord because Jesus paid that price. Many years ago in the Korean War, a Korean conflict, it all depends I guess where you were at that time, but it was still a war. That was fighting in that uh, Korean War there, young Korean soldiers against the Northern Communists. And then during that time, the northern communist soldiers captured a great number of the southern Korean soldiers. And they put them to death. They had them to line up out there. And then they gave orders that those soldiers be put to death. That was a young officer in the North Korean army with hatred in his eyes. And he told his men, he said, I want you to kill these fellows. And when he gave the orders, they killed him in cold blood. That was standing nearby the mother and father of one of these boys that was shot down. And it broke their heart. They saw the face of that young officer. They could never forget that face that gave the orders for their son to be put to death. Later on when the war ended and began to send those soldiers back across the 38th parallel, uh, there they, some of the communist soldiers did not want to go back. And in the group that did not want to go back with this young officer, that it give the command that these men be put to death. This father and mother were standing nearby, and it was told them the only way they could remain in South Korea, they'd have to have someone to stand for them, someone to be able to take them in and provide for them. And so they, this young uh, lieutenant, young officer that, that gave the command to the soldiers to be killed, he was standing there, and this mother and father whose son was slain, could never forget that face, the face of the man that gave the orders for their son to be put to death. But he would remain in the South. And they said, do we have anyone 
that's willing to take this young officer in to your home and let him remain in the South and take him in as your son. This mother and father stepped forth and said, we'll take this young man. He was a man responsible for the death of their son, but they said, we'll take this young man. And they took that young man into their home and they won him to Jesus Christ. And you know where he is today? He's a pastor in South Korea today. See, they're willing to redeem him and take him in and stand for him, although he had killed or had their son killed there in South Korea. It takes a love of God and the grace of God to do that, but that's what Jesus did for us. Number five, he's a type of Jesus Christ. Boy, is a type of Jesus Christ in that he's a man who gave rest. The Bible says in Ruth chapter 2 and verse 7, she said, I pray ye, let me glean and gather out the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. There was a place in the field in that hot sun whenever they grew tired. They could go into the tent and there would be water and so forth for them to drink. And this woman, Ruth, went to that tent and rested. She found rest in the tent of Boaz. Now, he's a type of Jesus Christ that gives rest. Now, we find rest in the Lord. Come me, all you that labor and heavy laden, Jesus said, and I will give you rest. That's rest in Christ. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9, the Bible said, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. A lot of people never really enter into that rest because of unbelief. You're saved, but you're not completely resting in the Lord. I had a pastor friend that passed it over in South Carolina, and he took a church that really caused him a lot of problems. He couldn't sleep at night. He couldn't rest. He was weary. He was about to have a nervous breakdown. And he went out in the woods with his Bible and spent many, many hours out there in the woods on his knees crying to God. He said, God, I'm disturbed. I can't rest. This church is about to kill me. And then he said, God, I want you to help me. Give me peace. Give me rest. All of a sudden, it seemed like the Spirit of God just took him over and gave him perfect rest. He came back home a different man. He walked in his pulpit a different man. And though as long as he remained as pastor of that church, he had perfect rest and perfect peace and worried no more about the situation. Turned it all over to God. Now there's some of you people right now listening to me. You, you, you're in a turmoil. You're disturbed. You can't rest at night. You worry about things that never happen. You try to live on yesterday. You're concerned about tomorrow instead of living for today. And you don't have that rest. You need to enter into the rest of Jesus Christ. Unload everything on him and completely rest in the Lord. And let God do the driving. There's no need of you trying to do the driving over the rough road when God will drive for you. Let God take care of everything. Turn all over to the Lord. Quit worrying about it. Get to sleep at night. Let God handle it. God can handle it better than you can, but he's not going to handle it until you turn it over to him. And when you turn it over to God and say, God, here it is. I can't handle it, Lord. This is it. I'll just turn it over to you. And you do that and mean business. And watch God take over and solve the situation. Number six, we find boy as a type of Jesus Christ in that he was a wealthy kinsman. This man was a wealthy man. The Bible says in Ruth chapter 2 and verse 1, And Naomi had a kinsman, a husband, a mighty man of wealth, and a family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. He was a rich man. In order that what they lost when they left Bethlehem and went down into Moab, Someone had to have money to buy that back. If not, they'd have to wait until the Jubilee year. That might have been many years away. Somebody had to buy that back. And here was the man that had the money to do it. He was a near kinsman. He was a rich man. And he could buy back everything that they lost. The little farm, the little home, the little belongings. He could buy it back and never miss the money. The Bible says in 2nd in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9, For you know by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. We have a Savior tonight that's rich. He's wealthy. He laid that aside temporarily, 
that he might come down and live in poverty, that we might live in riches and affluence and bondage on the other side. Now, Jesus is wealthy. He owns everything. Somebody said he owned the hills, the cattle on the hills, the taters in the hills. He owns all things, and he's our Savior. He is our great Boaz. That's a great king one time. He and his wife, the queen, were riding down the street. And there they saw a little ragged boy, little hungry looking fellow, going around picking stuff up out of the garbage cans and doing a little begging. And they inquired about that little boy and they found out he was trying to get a little food for his sick daddy. His mother had died, his daddy was on the seemly deathbed and they couldn't, uh, he had to go out and beg food and pick up food to feed his daddy. And so the king and queen was concerned about that. And then his daddy died. And the king and queen said, I want this boy in our palace. We want to adopt him as our son. And they took that boy in, took his old ragged, dirty clothes off, and brought him in and dressed him up. And then that boy grew up and became the next king on the throne there in this uh, kingdom. But about every day or so, he would go down to a certain room, and then he would turn and come back. Some of the people became curious about where he was going, what he was doing. And they went down one day, and you know what they saw? He picked up them little old dirty, ragged clothes that he wore when he was a little beggar. And he would look at them. And he'd look at them and lay them back down. You know what he was doing? He was remembering where he came from. He was remembering what he used to be. And beloved, now he was a king. But back there he was a pauper. A ragged boy and hungry. David said, remember the pit from which you were dig. You need to remember where you came from and what you were before God saved you. Sometimes I sit down and just think about and look back in my ignorance and what God saved me from and the poverty I was I grew up in back in the Hoover days. And I began to look back there and then I see what God delivered me from and how good God's been to me. It really touches my heart. And every child of God should occasionally go back and begin to think about what you were delivered from, where you used to be, where your parents came from, how they used to live. And you thank God every day for salvation. Number seven, we find he's a type of, of Jesus Christ in that he's the bridegroom. In Ruth chapter 4 and verse 10, more Ruth, the more by his wife of Marlon have I purchased to be my wife. There he became the bridegroom. He said, I purchased this woman to be my wife. He didn't say, I purchased her to be my slave. He didn't say, I purchased her to be my housekeeper. He didn't say, I purchased her to go out and work in the field. Now, some of these things may be included, but number one, he said, she's my wife. And when you say somebody is my wife, that covers a lot of territory. Don't ever call your wife the old woman. Don't ever say, the old woman, so-and-so. She's your wife. Why would you want to call her the old woman? If she's old, she knows it. Why call her the old woman? Why call him the old man? Say, that's my husband. And when you use the word wife, that means a lot. And you need to realize what that name means to say, she is my wife. And this man here, a type of Jesus, the bridegroom, said, I have married Ruth and she is my wife. Let that sink in. When you look at that woman you chose of all the women in the world, she was your choice. You picked her out and you married her. And when you look at her, you just say, that's my wife. And you ought to be able to say that with pride. Heard about a man one time when he married his wife, she weighed 118, then she weighed 250, then, and he was introducing her to some other preachers. He said, this is my wife. He said, when I married her, she weighed 118, and said, of course, she's filled out a little bit since then. Now, they may fill out occasionally, but she's still your wife. Now, you must remember that. Maybe you're bringing in too many grocers. You need to realize she is your wife. And you keep that in mind. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. 
as wife had made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteous of the saints. Our bridegroom, Jesus Christ, is coming for his wife, the church. We're going to get married, sit down to marriage, supper, the lamb, come back to this earth for a thousand year honeymoon. Are you looking forward to it? If not, you ought to be standing to your feet. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today in Jesus' name that you use the message, that you bless thy people, that you have your way. May out in the radio listening audience somebody be helped today. Maybe some sinner be saved, some wavering Christian come back in the fold. Your people be strengthened and confident. And may in this auditorium things be accomplished in the hearts of thy people. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Tracy's going to play a couple of stanzas. As she plays, if you're in this building, you want to get saved. You want to come back in the fellowship with God. Or you want to unite this church with this church where we receive members. The invitation is yours. Extend you that invitation or any other reason. I, didn't, if I haven't mentioned. If you want to come, you may. While well, we wait while she plays softly, waiting. If God is speaking, all I ask you to do is obey the Lord. 